this panel, we will be discussing energy uh, issues in the region and how to diversify our sources and supply as well. Uh, today with us we have uh, three speakers that will from a different perspective, geopolitical, political, but also economic, social, environmental, and technological, tackle this issue. Uh, I would like, I would invite you to present yourself and briefly say what is your core uh, uh, focus on energy diversification. My name is Nikita Oksanovic. I'm a senior researcher at the Belgrade Center for Security Policy and also an associate with LSE Ideas, a foreign policy think tank within London School of Economics and Political Science. My main focus is on great power politics, primarily in the Balkans and most frequently Russia would find itself on my radar and that's how I'm here. Thank you, welcome. Oh, hello there, I'm uh, Sergio Mitrescu. I uh, work as a researcher for the New Strategy Center in, in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, I'm uh, specializing in energy from a geopolitical perspective, mostly revolving around the wider Black Sea region and, uh, and the Western Balkans. Um, hello everyone, I'm Alexander Matsur, I'm Program Director for Climate and Energy at the Rest Foundation Belgrade. I'm an energy, climate and air policy analyst for many years. Main focus would be the affordability of energy. This is the primary area of our research, but we also deal with all, with all other aspects of energy policy, including security. Thank you. So the context is energy diversification in our region. We will start uh, from Serbia and then expand to the region of Western Balkans and then go even further to the region of Southeast Europe. And to start, I would like to invite uh, Alexander to tell us, to chart a snapshot, to give us an overview of energy mix in Serbia and in the region of Western Balkans and kind of to uh, tell us a little bit more uh, how this present a challenge in this time of energy crisis. Thank you, Jasminka. Uh, it's important, of course, when we start this type of discussions to have a, at least a broad understanding of what types of energy are countries in the region using, what are the shares of certain energy sources, uh, and what does it mean for different aspects of, of energy security, of energy policy, of development policy and other policies that are affected by the energy sector and almost every policy is affected by the energy sector. Uh, countries in the region, including Republic of Serbia, um, are, let's say, import dependent to the extent that they're slightly below the average of the European Union. So in terms of overall energy, import dependency of the countries in the region is roughly between 30 and 40%. Um, Bosnia and Herzegovina has somewhat lower uh, import dependency, below 30%, while there are countries with a, a little bit higher import dependency, but let's say roughly the countries are dependent 30 to 40% for the overall total energy supply. Uh, this dependency obviously differs across different types of energy, so it's largest uh, for oil and for natural gas, because the region doesn't have a significant production of these two types of energy which are in the focus mostly. But also in order to understand how big is this uh, share, uh, perhaps it's uh, relevant to know that the share of natural gas, for example, in the total energy supply of the countries in the region is far below the share that it has in European Union. Serbia has the largest share of natural gas in total energy supply and it stood that some 13 percent for the last um, year with data availability maybe it it grows a little bit so maybe it's going to be a little bit different but this is roughly a, a figure to remember so a little bit more than one tenth of the entire energy supply comes from natural gas and similarly also in the final consumption natural gas is a little bit more than one tenth of the energy while it also participates in in the heat production in different uh, countries. It's also important to understand that for natural gas that besides Serbia only North Macedonia has uh, a relatively significant share of natural gas in, in the total energy supply and it's a little bit lower than Serbia and it stands at 10 percent. So maybe these, these are the figures to remember. Bosnia and Herzegovina some very very little share and no natural gas in the mix of other 
countries, some in Albania, but without networks, so it's a different type of, uh, of usage of natural gas. I think this is relatively important to, to remember because frequently we we'll discuss a lot about natural gas and this is very important topic by all means, but it's also good to understand that we are talking about one-tenth of total energy supply in the countries where it plays a role, and in other countries it doesn't play a role at all. Uh, the countries uh, in the region rely on coal mostly, so in terms of shares of different fuels in total energy supply, let's say that coal is roughly 50%. Uh, obviously, Albania being the exception, because it almost doesn't have any coal in total energy supplies, it's negligible. While other countries, roughly 50% of all energy produced in the countries comes from coal, with differences again between the countries in the region, but for this, I think, a level uh, of understanding this would be sufficiently uh, to know. The coal is basically the main uh, fuel for electricity production, and <coughs> let's say, again, roughly, two-thirds of electricity in the region are produced from coal, it's lignite, so it's a poor quality coal, uh, and one-third comes from hydro energy. Well, we can talk about numbers more, I think it's enough, and maybe just to say what is, what does it mean, what, what is it, uh, why is it relevant to understand this type of, uh, why, what this type of mix actually brings. It brings also a high carbon and energy intensity to the region. Uh, which means that our economies in, in the region spend a lot of energy to produce one uh, dollar of uh, gross, gross uh, domestic product of GDP and also emit a comparatively very high amount of greenhouse gases for production of one unit of GDP and the region is among uh, the most carbon intensive uh, regions in the world uh, and also very high energy intensity which is several times higher than the European Union. In, terms of, in times of crisis, this is obviously, uh, it means larger vulnerability uh, than those who need less energy to produce one dollar uh, of GDP. Maybe this would be Th Thank you, Alexander. I will just have one more question. What is with modern renewables? You mentioned large hydro, but what with modern renewables? Well, modern renewables, you don't see them in the balance. If, you, if you're looking at the Excel chart, this, this uh, this bar is really, really very small, but it's growing. So the wind can be seen in these charts and it's more and more present and, and this share is growing, but at this point in time, it's, it's close, close to negligible in terms of total share. Again, I'm saying it's changing, but when you look at the bar, there is almost nothing besides coal and hydro for electricity production. Thank you, Alexander. I will now switch to Vuk if he can tell us a little bit more from the perspective of geopolitical and political consequences of the, this situation and this energy mix in Serbia, primarily that Alexander just uh, presented. Absolutely. Well, as uh, people can probably imagine, I mean, the country which is always in the background of the topics that we are discussing today is Russia. Surprise, surprise. So, at that point, I mean, I can tell you, when it comes to Serbia in particular, and not just Serbia, but I would say the rest of the Western Balkans, uh, Russian influence is frequently overstated. However, the pillars of influence that Russia does have are being used with, uh, very effectively. And these three are Russia's permanent place in the UN Security Council, which gives it leverage over regional disputes like Kosovo or the stat status of Bosnia. The second is Russia's popularity among parts of the local population. And the third one is the one that we are discussing today is energy. So, for Serbia, energy dependence vis-a-vis -vis Russia has been a reality ever since the Yugoslav and the Soviet days given the infrastructure. So, it has been around for a very, very long time. However, in recent years, we can say that there is a very powerful geopolitical and political component of this relationship. Because we all know one fact. That is that Russia still owes a majority shares package in the Serbian oil and gas industry Nice. When this happened, back in, in the period between 2007-2008, the Deloitte, the professional service company from the United States, made its own accounting estimates of the value of these assets, which was 2.2 billion. You needed to pay 2.2 billion US dollars in order to acquire the majority share package. In the end, Nice was provided, the controlled share package was given to the Russians for 400 million 
dollars in a transaction in which the people who participated in, tra in this transaction years later admitted what was guiding them. They said, yes, energy dependence was part of it, but there was also a very powerful political and geopolitical logic. Number one, they believed that giving the Russians the controlled share package in East was below the market price was a compensation for now, for, for the hope that now defunct project South Stream Pipeline would be constructed over Serbian territory. And number two, it was Russian protection in the UN Security Council on Kosovo. That bet didn't pay off. And we see with all the locomotion regarding Third Stream Pipeline that this reality still remains in place. But I can also say that the war in Ukraine has also been something of a wake-up call for Belgrade, at least when it comes to energy security. And it appears to me that despite the fact that Serbia will not give up all of its ties with Russia, I can see that energy diversification is one thing that the Serbian government does not shy away from, and that it is willing to potentially invest, and that it is willing to look for partners internationally that will help. Belgrade in its energy diversification vendor. So despite the overall state of the Serbo-Russian tie, I still, uh, ties, I still believe that, uh, that at least diversifying energy supply lines will be one of the areas on which the, the incumbent of the new Serbian government, since we are about to have a new government, will, look, uh, will invest significant efforts and attention. Thank you, Vuk. Well, it seems that uh, based on what Alexander just presented and the share of natural gas in total energy supply, even in Western Balkans, but also in Serbia, we uh, can maybe turn this energy, current energy crisis into an opportunity. And therefore, I would like to invite uh, Sergio now, to, who is uh, also co-author of the study that has dealt with these uh, diversification alternatives and possibilities, just now to provide a snapshot of the whole region of Southeast Europe. How does this look? And then we'll go later in the second <coughs> round into the consequences and alternatives, opportunities that come basically from these challenges. Uh, so it might seem uh, rather counterintuitive at first to focus on gas being given that is not too, too popular in the Western Balkans, but uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, electricity producing power plants are more than 30 years old. So we are on the cusp of a systemic uh, change in uh, the energy matrix of the Western Balkan countries. If we are to, to zoom out, we, we can easily tell that the Eastern phrase in, uh, phrase in Turkey is, uh, is a focal point because we, th that's where we get the junction between uh, TANAP, which is a Trans-Anatolian pipeline carrying Azeri gas, and uh, the trans hydratic pipeline, which carries that gas further into Italy. Turk Stream uh, ends less than a kilometer away from the top tunnel junction, effectively creating a de facto to a freeway uh, junction. If we move well northwards a bit, uh, we have the Trans-Balkan pipeline, which comes from uh, Ukraine and Romania and essentially cuts uh, Bulgaria in half at a horizontal line, bringing uh, gas into, into Serbia. If we are to move at uh, an above level ground, Greece has been investing uh, a lot of money and resources in new LNG terminals. They opened one uh, in early 2000. Uh, and now uh, Doania Alexandropolis will go online in 2023, Doania in Thessaloniki in 2025, uh, the one in Dioriga will uh, get a decision by the end of this year. And of course, the, we have the LNG terminal in Kirk in, uh, in Croatia. So what, uh, what we're seeing right now, it's um, a two-layer systemic shift, right, in which at a regional level, those uh, power plants producing electricity are going to go offline because they're obviously uh, from the Yugoslav period. And, uh, well, the Western Balkans is experiencing a positive enroachment with a uh, vast array of uh, gas pipelines being, uh, being constructed around it, which obviously points to many, many opportunities in the near future. Uh, at, the, at the regional level, of course, those developments have not gone unnoticed. Bulgaria connected to Greece with, uh, with an interconnector which went online in September. And North Macedonia, of course, because of its small size and uh, geographical positioning, is connecting both south, southwards, westwards, and northwards. So basically, in a couple of years, North Macedonia will get access to the LNG terminals in Greece. It will connect to Bulgaria and essentially to the Trans-Balkan pipeline, and northwards to, to Serbia. So in the next decade or so, we're going to see the share of, uh, of gas 
exploding in the region. That's why I wanted to touch upon all those uh, gas developments going in and around the, the region. I think uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Now I'll switch to Alexander. And uh, uh, I would like to start the discussion about these consequences of gas expansion or uh, different routes, but also of neglecting the uh, other potentials uh, that uh, Western Balkan has embedded here for development of renewable energy and uh, uh, diversification of energy mix, not only gas supply. So I would like, I would invite Alexander to, to talk a little bit about this, about these opportunities and the consequences of not doing or doing certain thing in terms of also economic competitiveness uh, 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 aspects, but also if we are looking towards EU and uh, standards that are required uh, to decarbonize energy system and the economy. Well, thank you, Asmika. Sergio um, rightfully pointed that um, the production facilities in the region for electricity are very old. So from whichever angle you are looking at, uh, we are scheduled to, hopefully scheduled, to renovate the uh, production capacities for uh, electricity in the region. And this is why natural gas can be more important than its actual share, as Sergio uh, rightfully mentioned. The current situation, including this uh, aged fleet, uh, means uh, lower productivity. It's also uh, due to the fact that uh, lignite extraction in itself is a low productive activity because you need to extract a huge quantities of earth, dust and different materials to reach the coal, the lignite, which again in one cubic meter uh, has very little energy because it's a low calorific uh, fuel. So the consequences of this exploitation are also uh, environmental. There are huge detrimental environmental consequences affecting not only climate, but also air pollution and bringing significant health costs to the societies. Uh, so the current mix is, I would say, um, not facilitating the competitiveness of the economy and also brings relatively high external costs that are not well accounted for and that are not paid for. So this is a challenge, but this is also, given the aging fleet, uh, I say we are approaching the time when we have to make some investment decisions. Uh, obviously, it's a question also who's going to make these investment decisions. I don't think this uh, uh, type of event can accommodate larger discussion on that topic, but it's not irrelevant whether it's going to be public or privately financed, and I think that this can also influence significantly the mix that we are going to see in the future and uh, uh, its consequences on the competitiveness uh, of the economy. As I said, the current mix also brings high carbon and energy intensity, which means uh, a lower starting position for energy uh, transition. Uh, but even if we forget about the Paris Agreement, which I don't think we can and we, we will, uh, there is a, a, I would say a myriad of reasons to undergo this transition, not least because the fleet is actually so old that we are anyhow going to need a new fleet, which is also, I think, something important to understand that the vast majority of the energy across the region is being used uh, for non-commercial activities. Uh, so residential sector and transport sectors are the sectors in which we spend most of our energy. Um, and it's difficult to sustain that mix if the economy is also not competitive. Maybe just a side note, like the highest gas price in the world were paid by, by the, uh, the Eastern Asia economies and still those economies managed to sell all of its goods to Europe. So it's not about price. The price of the, of the resource is not the main driver of the competitiveness. So we have to take into account many other aspects. Maybe just as a side note also, um, the affordability of energy is also a very big issue uh, in the region for the, for the population. Uh, and it's a challenge that we are need to tackle also uh, in the period that we are um, in the, in the upcoming period, and I don't see how uh, expanded use of natural gas in residential sector can contribute to any uh, of the aspects uh, that we have here. So all these questions about infrastructure are definitely very, very important. But again, I think the region can 
adopt strategies in which the exposure to the risks connected to the supply of natural gas can be well mitigated and, re and s certainly significantly uh, reduced, which we can perhaps address a little bit later. Thank you, Alexander. I would like now uh, to ask Vuk to comment on the more or less political consequences uh, of these decisions. Uh, would this be politically feasible here in Serbia? I think in Serbia that uh, politics always uh, played a major part, that the politics informed large part of uh, national decision making on this issue. Because yes, the reason why the study that you all have in front of us where the two countries which were sort of in the center of it all are Serbia and Romania. Why? The two countries are basically neighbors, so they share the same physical space. However, of course, a very big difference. Why? One is almost completely dependent on, on uh, Russia for its national gas import, while on the other hand, Romania, which is a Black Sea literal country, so barely imports any, uh, any Russian gas. So that means that there was a political decision which preceded it and political strategy which preceded efforts for energy diversification. And yes, I mean, unlike, for example, Germany, which has a very difficult time of finding energy alternatives, the Balkans, despite the fact that, okay, yes, we also have, just like in case of Germany, infrastructure, it was constructed over <coughs> decades, but we are still blessed with a geography which puts us close to other energy sources. I mean by that Black Sea, I also mean Turkey, which is, of course, a conduit for the supply of energy, as well as via Black Sea and via Turkey, uh, access to Caspian Sea and Azerbaijan. But in this particular case, what was always missing was the political will. And yes, it tells you something, energy dependency is important, but it was also, there, there has always been an interest of the local political actors who were guiding themselves with their own self-interest and their own parochial needs, because they were always saying, well, why should we bother ourselves with this? Plus the secrecy and non-transparency which involves uh, dealing with Moscow is also something that fits us. Why should we invest uh, extra efforts in anything? But uh, I can say with a great deal of confidence that one, uh, one event was uh, transformative, and I believe it is a sign of things to come, which is the opening of Interconnector in Greece in Alexandropolis, where we did see high attendance from uh, Michel from European uh, Commission. We also saw a uh, Greek Prime Minister, we saw North Macedonian Prime Minister, as well as the President of Serbia. So I would say that Gini is now out of the bottle and that yes, the political <laughs> wings have changed and that the political decision has been made. Okay, thank you. Sergio, since we now heard that there is a kind of political uh, momentum <laughs> as compared to the uh, previous period. Uh, would you then kindly uh, tell us exactly what we could get from Southeast region here in Serbia and Western Balkans, how we could get a benefit? Um, I think the, the biggest carrot lies in the, in the Black Sea with mm -hmm. the Turkish and Romanian discoveries. Um, it's an important decision to make, although uh, Turkey discovered approximately 520 billion cubic meters in the Black Sea, which is a lot. Uh, Turkey is an energy-hungry country, so probably most of the gas they, they found will be used for uh, their developing industries. Romania, on the other hand, discovered approximately 200 billion uh, cubic meters of, of gas. Uh, the ANA parameter went online this year. The Neptune one would go online uh, in 2026, hopefully amounting to about 85 billion cubic meters. But Romania has an incredibly healthy energy mix and a population which is stagnant, if not decreasing. So almost every molecule of that gas, gas will be destined for, uh, for exports. So I think that would... Um, that would fundamentally alter the geopolitical dynamic in the region because there will be cheap gas very close by. And I, I, I guess that Romania has every interest in having stable neighbors by providing them the gas that they need. And that in turn would enable the Western Balkans to play a more subtle game in there in its geopolitical choices vis-a-vis -vis the West and Russia. Because that would probably break up the Russian monopoly over gas deliveries in the, in the region. Uh what do we, uh, Alexander, I'm moving now to you. Uh, what can we do here in Western Balkans region and in Serbia before we start importing 
and exploring and investing heavily in new sources or uh, routes. Is there anything else that can be done in terms of uh, development of renewable energy? Because Sergio just mentioned that Rom Romania has reached its uh, certain level that is satisfactory at the moment. But you said that our renewable energy uh, in the mix is negligible. Our modern renewable energy in the electricity mix is negligible. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, as, 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 as you know, and uh, I think it's also important for, for the audience to know that, uh, there is a relatively large share of renewable energy uh, in, across the region which comes from fuel wood. So, mm -hmm. And it's a very significant share of uh, energy in all the countries of the, of the Western Balkans. Uh, and uh, this is also... A, an important information because these are large quantities of resource. We're talking about millions tons of wood being burnt, mostly in domestical devices. So it's a really significant amount of resource, uh, which is um, very poorly utilized. It's very inefficiently utilized. So this is a waste of money, waste of resources. It's a threat to public health, and it's also exposing um, households to uh, energy poverty. The thing is that we haven't made the big decisions in the energy sector for quite a long period of time and uh, as a consequence uh, we are facing difficult threats not just from, from the war in Ukraine, it's just superponed of, of internal weaknesses uh, of the region. So again I say we are in the time when we need to make the decisions and there are things that can be done. Uh, first of all, there is a huge space for um, improvement of energy efficiency across the board. People usually think about you know, insulation of buildings when, when somebody mentions energy efficiency, uh, but uh, that's definitely not the only thing and perhaps not even the first thing. The price signals were very wrong also in certain segments of, of uh, energy markets um, in our country, but not only in our country. So uh, as an example, I, I can say that our regulatory agency, we discussed that Yasminka mm -hmm. a few days ago, published its regular um, um, piece on the heating for the next winter and, and the conclusion, the message from the regulatory agency that the cheapest way to heat in the Republic of Serbia in the winter 22-23 is natural gas you can immediately see that it's really insane. I mean, and it's coming from the regulatory agency which actually has to regulate prices that nothing like that ever happens. So it's, it's double insane. But this is a, a, a signal of uh, also a sign of, uh, of a wrong uh, price signals that were here for many, many years and that actually uh, affect very much the energy mix. Uh, I think we are going to divorce very soon from the so wrong price signals across the region and this is definitely going to affect also the mix and I think this will unlock uh, the demand for energy efficiency and the potential is really, really huge. In use of natural gas, that potential is, I would say, enormous. In the past, when we were doing some analysis, actually a lot of gas being consumed in Serbia has not been paid for for different reasons. So uh, uh, this practice alone would affect natural gas uh, consumption a lot. Um, in developing power sector, which is, uh, which is a challenge and which is uh, uh, um, an enigma for the future, there are options. Under utilization of renewables, uh, we mentioned already. The expose of the prime minister the other day was also mentioning that in a different uh, uh, from different perspectives, maybe not entirely, we cannot be optimistic based on what we saw there, but there is uh, obviously a huge potential for further development of wind energy and solar energy. This is not going to resolve all our issues. This is why, again, the question of use of natural gas in power production can be raised. Also, the question of use of nuclear energy, but what the region has, and which is perhaps different from other regions, is also a, a relatively huge potential for biomass use and possibility for increased potential for biomass use, which is also a controversial topic in itself, but you cannot avoid dealing um, with the controversial topics uh, in this sector. Uh, the region has a lot of uh, poor quality forests and a lot of unused land, which can be used also to grow uh, biomass. I'm talking about biomass because the biomass is the only renewable resource, uh, the only resource that can not be just carbon neutral, it can be carbon negative if you install carbon capture and storage on biomass facilities. 
and which can provide base load, which is, uh, which is where the role of natural gas was also seen. None of it is easy. Uh, it all requires large investments, but also I think we all change the perspective on what is expensive, what is not expensive, because we spend billions of taxpayers' money to import energy. Now energy costs are socialized. Uh, in Serbia, but not only in Serbia. So I think we really have a completely different situation. Energy efficiency, very, very underestimated as a resource, as a potential for future development, for mitigating the impacts of, of different types of crises, including the, the, the crises related to the supply of natural gas. Uh, straightforward line also for development of wind energy and solar energy, up to technical potentials and depending on the conflict for balancing, not entering into details. And I would say a, a thing to look uh, in this region and to have a serious decision whether and to which extent to go into the biomass exploitation uh, for energy. Thank you very much. I would stay a little bit longer on this issue, just not to lose the, 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 the logical chain here. If you can specify a little bit, go into more details about energy poverty, because we know that know that this energy crisis uh, affected uh, energy poverty even more, or fuel poverty across the Euro European Union countries, but also in the region of Western Balkans. But we have been dealing with this issue for a long time, and it's, more, it's different from the poverty in the European Union countries. So I would like you to present a little bit uh, more about this, how many households, what, what is, uh, just to kind of picture, visualize the real potential that we're missing out on at the moment. Well, uh, as I said, the, the households in the region rely very much on biomass for, for their energy supply. In the Republic of Serbia, for example, the largest share of energy in household consumption, not for heating, entire household consumption comes from biomass. It's, it's a fuel wood. Uh, and biomass is related also to natural gas because energy prices tend to follow each other. I mean, the biomass price is in the markets always hooked to its closest substitute, be it electricity, be it natural gas. And uh, uh, the regulatory agency praises itself to sell natural gas as the cheapest way of heating, but doesn't say anything about, for example, the growing costs of biomass, which in Serbia has all, almost doubled since, the, since last year. This is a huge, huge uh, effect for households who are relying on this. And uh, it's in Serbia, at least one million households rely on biomass uh, for heating using uh, wood stoves. And it's three million across the region of the Western Balkans. This is a very ineffective way to use uh, biomass. You need a lot of it. Uh, and if the price doubles, it is a significant social issue for the those households, but also for the entire economy, because those people are not going to have money to spend for other needs, which is going to curb the demand for goods and services that the economy is providing. So this is a macro issue, uh, and it is obviously related to the general poverty and the relatively low incomes, but also to the significant and I would say striking and frightening inefficiency of use of this energy across the region, frequently overlooked, not very popular public policy thing, no pipelines, uh, no red tapes, uh, no single investment worth billions of euros. A lot of work needed to reverse this trend, which is undermining, um, I would say, also the basic security, because people who are going to face difficulties in obtaining basic, uh, basic comfort it's really something we, we wouldn't like to see. Investing in this, we are actually enhancing energy security. Absolutely. And, 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 gen and general security also in the country. And I would say also maybe just to add that uh, um, the region is home to some district heating uh, systems that are based on natural gas. This is absolutely not necessary. There are many aspects in which natural gas cannot be replaced for high temperature processes in industry and everything else. But for heating, natural gas can be replaced. And I mean, if Scandinavians don't use it for heating, then it's, I've heard cold in Scandinavia. So I guess that we can also, uh, be able to move away from this. Uh, we had signals, many signals, that we should think about different um, ways of providing heat. We didn't, but now we have even stronger signals, so maybe we will respond this time. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we know now what we can still do here. Actually, we haven't even started working on uh, the diversification of energy mix in our own country and the region. But let's now move on to the 
neighboring region and uh, ask you talked Sergio about the different uh, option interconnectors and uh, uh, how to diversify the supply of gas natural gas but uh, what about financial feasibility of this and also political feasibility considering that uh, some of these countries like Romania is the EU country and Serbia is still, well, who can maybe build on this is not. And we see the pressures uh, coming from different uh, sides. Uh, the, the last one is about Yanaf. Uh, how, this will, how this can be reconciled and can it be reconciled? And also, what is the financial feasibility of these projects? Uh, so, of course, there is always a financial risk with gas investments because gas... Uh, will probably fluctuate in price over the next decade because you make planning now when everyone is scrambling for gas but if gas prices will return to the prices that they were at in 2019 those uh, some of those investments obviously won't yield uh, the expected results from a geopolitical perspective with those developments they're incredibly gradual they don't happen all at once so i think that western balkan countries will decide their own path based on the feedback that they're going to get from Brussels and Moscow, because those projects take a lot of negotiations and obviously decades to, to implement. So I personally don't think that uh, in the diversifying energy can lead to a conflictual situation, because the signals are being received very early on. And if the pressure is strong enough, as it was with South Stream from the European Union's part, some of the projects can simply be be dropped. So I don't think this would uh, lead to a, a conflictual situation. Uh, I wanted to touch earlier upon renewables from, from, uh, from a Black Sea perspective. There is a fair amount of untapped potential there as well in Romania's Dobruja region and uh, with uh, the expansion of the Chernobyl and nuclear power plants and the uh, offshore capacity in the, the wind capacity in the Black Sea. A strong weakness is that Romania and Serbia don't have a real energy connection. The, the cables are running uh, at a very low voltage, so that energy cannot be transported, which is uh, something which is plaguing, of course, the region and at uh, an intra-regional level in the, in the Balkans. So that would be an avenue for exploration, trying to tap into the renewable potential of the Black Sea region as well for, for Serbia and then further around the, the region. Okay. How, what about political feasibility, considering that it's EU country and with all these, uh, let's say, pressures so far that we're seeing almost every day? Well, there is, of course, uh, this uh, political deficiency, because less, if uh, the focus of my Sergio's analysis was a potential partnership between Romania and Serbia, there is this uh, impediment that one country is a member of the EU, which means it sits at the decision-making table, while the other one... Uh, sits uh, outside the tent, so it is not uh, di directly involved in the proceedings. So that does create a deficiency on Belgrade's side of the fence. <coughs> Nevertheless, there is one asset through which this uh, harsh political reality can still be bridged, and it is also a very powerful force, which is a simple force of uh, geography. Because one of the rare assets that Serbia still has, it's, uh, it's uh, geography. It is, I mean, we have seen this during the the refugee crisis where Serbia probably because of it, the pl its place had a disproportionate political voice and at the same time I think we have also seen with some other EU initiatives which is for example on 5G infrastructure because of the place that Serbia has when it comes to the regional internet traffic it is the only country in Western Balkans which is part of the so-called 5G public-private uh, groupings which is a new any sponsored groupings of uh, private companies and governments which are important for the, for the development of 5G technology. Serbia is the only country in the region which is not a member of the EU, which is part of this EU initiative. So on that point, even without membership, because of its geography, Serbia will, I believe, still ca has an asset to seize. And it is important that in order to seize this asset, it needs to have a power... Uh, a smart, a smart partner which is already in the EU on this project. And one of the policy recommendations which, which me and Sergio have outlined in this analysis is that if Bucharest and Belgrade have a concrete proposal, have a concrete idea about the project of energy diversification, one of the things that they have to do together is to jointly lobby together in Brussels on getting the EU funding. So. Once there, is, once there is a political will and once there is a good strategic planning between the two capitals, 
the geographical space we already have, but once we have a good political and technical plan, with that one, then we can brag, beg for money, so to speak. Thank you. Um, Alexander, what do you think about this financial feasibility? But I would also like you to touch upon a little bit uh, of uh, net uh, zero, uh, let's say, future of the EU, but also UNFCCC as an overarching policy and uh, climate goals that Serbia is party to. And then we know that European Union will be uh, establish, uh, establishing carbon adjustment mechanism in the near future. Uh, we also know that uh, this crisis, even coming from Brussels, is not supposed to jeopardize long-term climate goals. So in terms of financial feasibility and, let's say, climate environmental feasibility, what would be your uh, thinking about these, uh, let's say, competing uh, alternatives and solutions? Well, yeah, the financing obviously is, uh, is an issue. Uh, one example of, um, that maybe can show that the financial availability uh, is better than we think is, uh, for example, I think in Serbia currently, there is 12 billion euros uh, in the deposits of citizens sitting idle in the banks. I mean, this is, for example, significant amou amount of money, a very short-term deposit. So I would say that this is a sign of lack of trust in the, in the uh, investment opportunities rather than mm -hmm. the availability of financing. Uh, and I think, I think I'm going to lose the mic, but I'm going to save the mic. I think okay. we hear you. <laughs> uh, um, and I think that the financial availability um, would be revealed once we really have a, a, a better environment in which the financing can take place. We are not a member of the EU, but we are contracting party to the Energy Community Treaty, and the establishment of the Energy Community Treaty 17 years ago, the aim was to create a single energy market across the European continent and single investment and regulatory framework. We are not there. This is not good. Uh, the region, for different reasons, um, has not entirely been integrated in, in this uh, respect into the European market. This is, I think, important driving factor. Uh, so the predict predictable legal framework, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, development of different streams doesn't help us uh, build trust in the investment framework. It's not only our countries to blame. There were um, numerous European countries uh, committing to South Stream, despite the fact that the, those commitments were clearly against, you know, different, different rules. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the preconditions, once the preconditions are better, I think there will be uh, financing available. And as I said before, um, I think there is also a risk of public financing uh, overcrowding out the, 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 the private investments in the energy sector, uh, which in turn can also affect the effectiveness of investments. And in then definitely it is going to cause also probably to the lower level of overall investments and we may be fall, falling short of what is required uh, to invest. But in that sense, I'm not pessimist. Uh, uh, if you really recognize uh, together as a region or, or the neighboring countries, also the opportunities that there are, we have. We are ex exploiting for 60 years now a very precious infrastructure jointly uh, on, the, on the Danube River, the uh, hydropower plants. So I think that, that there are also uh, other examples of uh, how regional cooperation can be really very beneficial, including in lowering risks for for investments. Maybe just to mention the last messages that we've heard about uh, the, the announcements of investment don't go in this direction. The, the pipelines announced are in different directions, which I don't think is good. So this is something that we uh, need to rediscuss. And the last thing, we didn't mention that the region has good geography, but the region is almost entirely landlocked. This is very, very important when energy markets are concerned, and this is also something that we need to think about, and this is why we need to be really very careful in planning uh, uh, in the energy sector, because opportunities are lower and risks are higher when you are a landlocked country, and many countries in the region are effectively yeah, landlocked. If Thank you. If I can summarize, we need more predictable or clear vision. We need uh, uh, clear alternatives that are also uh, in line with energy community standards. And we also need to take care of a possible lock-in. 
And the net zero, I have you yeah, answered, yeah. but this is really, I mean, we, we discussed that in, in the past. Now the, the horizons, time horizon somehow collided. So people are now, uh, let go climate change, but the question is here. It's also it's a question going, of security. It's, <laughs> uh, it's really a question of security yeah. and whether ones want to run the risk and pretend that there is no climate agenda. Well, it's also possibly an option. It doesn't going to help financing, I would say. Yeah. And you mentioned Gerda, but we saw uh, really low levels of water and uh, hydrology. And uh, based on the predictions of the UNFCCC, <coughs> we will see more of these uh, droughts uh, and extreme weather events in this region, which means that we might not be able to rely on this type of energy as we think we would. But maybe just to add also that the potential, there is still some potential in yeah. hydro giving all these tricks for reversible hydropower mm -hmm. and the region can actually really be a significant source of balancing power, not just for the region, but also uh, for the rest uh, of the Europe, but it requires really heavy investments and I would say definitely we need to have clear, clear and predictable rules. Thank you. Thank you all. I think we are running out of time for this type of presentation and discussion. And I would uh, like to invite the audience uh, briefly, if somebody has a question for our panelists, please. I see one, two, three, four, five hands. <laughs> please go ahead and one by one. I don't see you very well because I have light in my eyes. So maybe, Sergio, maybe you can help. <laughs> but uh, yeah, OK. My name is Andrei, I'm from Romania. I would like to ask you um, about uh, recent developments um, regarding oil when President Vucic uh, advocated for the link with uh, Hung Hungary uh, and connect uh, Serbia to Družba. How, how is this fit into you know, achieving independence from Russian energy? Who is this uh, uh, question to address uh, to? Who let's say there's Serbian panelists. Vuk. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I never said that it would be easy, but I would say that uh, there are still uh, some uh, some very tough uh, interests. I mean, I think that in this particular case, I think that we should not just uh, consider the Serbian side of the <laughs> equation, but we should also take a look at the Hungarian side of the equation. I think that Belgrade-Budapest partnership at this moment in time is very powerful and that there are probably some uh, counter favors that Belgrade has to return to Budapest as well. So on that point, <laughs> while I uh, do agree, uh, but uh, at the same time we can take a look at uh, the energy dependence in one other way. Perhaps the point is not whether you buy Russian gas or not, but the point is whether the Russian gas is the only gas that you're buying. That's also part of the equation. So yes, while opportunistically speaking, there is a very powerful uh, sense of, uh, of uh, Belgrade and Budapest doing their independent deals, which, uh, which is a self-interest based uh, on a calculation from both Vucic and Orban, I think that, uh, there are, that, we should, uh, that we should definitely not give up on these ideas that we have uh, just uh, outlined here. Alexander, you also have something to say. Uh, the way I see the Serbian side of the equation, it was a big surprise to hear that, that this is a strategic direction for connection to the oil infrastructure. Okay, uh, more questions? Please go ahead. Yes. Um, hello, uh, my name is Neven Shakaric Stojanovic. I'm a researcher from the um, Institute of uh, International Politics and Economics here in Belgrade. Um, I would just like to make one uh, quick uh, consideration, if you allow me, um, considering that this um, energy diversification is actually, uh, speaking from Serbian perspective, uh, coming from a um, tendency of Serbia to align with European energy acquis. So uh, basically what European energy acquis uh, speaks is that one dominant supplier is a problem per se. Uh, of course, there is a Russian Yes, uh, for most Central and Southeast European, but also it would be like, uh, for instance, Algerian gas for Iberian pe Peninsula. So one dominant supplier is actually the biggest problem. But of course, uh, from the from the Southeast European perspective, it is uh, Russian gas in the current security situation. Even though uh, these energy diversification uh, tendencies are actually speed up 
way before uh, February this year, considering that a gas crisis started uh, before this year. So um, there are a lot of questions. And uh, can you, you pose yes. one question I because we have two, other yes, people? Please, uh, one, only one. Only I can one. Give you. Okay. So uh, <laughs> maybe if uh, uh, some of the speakers. Uh, could tackle possible geopolitical uh, consequences of renewables in the future, considering all those open questions about um, would, uh, would the energy transition based on renewables could ease or worsen international rela energy relations? Uh, because there are a lot of issues considering, uh, for instance, that uh, China now is the, the biggest uh, green investor and uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest actually um, uh, exporter of the of the green technologies. How that could be? Uh, okay. What consequences? Okay. Well, I Thanks. can in part uh, reply. I mean, regarding that, I can tell you that uh, yes, Europe is uh, faced with uh, another uh, very uh, poor choice of whether it will replace dependency on Russia on gas or whether it will replace it with dependency on China, because China does dominate the rare earth minerals industry and it dominates not only, not only exploitation, but more important than that, it, uh, pro there are other players which are trying now to join the game, like Australia and the United States. However, the big problem is that China dominates uh, the refining process when it comes to rare earth minerals, which are essential for the renewable, uh, for the renewable energy uh, technology. And, uh, one of the areas, I mean, I'm at this stage, I mean, this is unrelated to this panel, but at this stage, I'm co-authoring a paper on Russian foreign policy in Africa. One potential risk for Europe in this particular case is that it, and that is in Africa, where it, where it might be faced with a Sino-Russian Entente, where the Russians will be doing the extracting of the rare earth minerals, while the Chinese will be doing uh, the refining uh, process and that would put uh, Europe in another new form of uh, dependency. So, of course, this, is, uh, this also creates, uh, of course, the, the complications for uh, the Southeastern Europe, but uh, I would say that at this stage in time, from what I can see, that uh, the region does not have the capacities, neither technological nor financial, to do easy transa transition to renewables without significant uh, help, logistical, technical, uh, financial from Brussels. Thank you. Another question? Yes. I, we can take a few more questions and we need Thank to you. close the panel. Thank Please you so ahead. much. Edward Joseph uh, here from Johns Hopkins Science in the U.S. Uh, thank you. Excellent panel. Uh, a very specific question for you, uh, but rather than the medium term potential for diver diversification, which sounds uh, exciting and, and appealing and practical, uh, I want to bring you to the immediate, immediate of uh, the crisis in, in Ukraine. And let's just imagine, for whatever reasons, and we can come up with them, uh, that Russia does uh, uh, what it did to Bulgaria, to Serbia. And, and Russia, for whatever reason, cuts off Serbia. So I want to ask you, what are Serbia's options in that case? And Vuk, you, you mentioned uh, Nice and the sale of Nice. And I've been told there's an option to nationalize Nice. That, as one possibility. In other words, uh, is it, uh, does in fact Moscow hold really all the uh, cards here, all the leverage, or does Serbia have some options if it were to, to face this cutoff? And just very quickly, if you have any comment on the fact that Zorana Mihalovic is not in the new government. Oh, Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think that yes, in theory, if the Russians do something that extreme, Maybe, I mean, the Serbia can also do something extreme, but at this moment in time, judging from the behavior of Alexander Vucic and Belgrade, it would appear to me that this is one option that they want to avoid. It appears to me that Vucic has every intention of surviving this winter, and that sort of explains the, the price deal that he has already achieved with the Russians. So until he gets a new, uh, new alternative, he has to think uh, in these uh, short terms. But on uh, Zorana Mihailovic's uh, point, I think that, yes, uh, her being out of the government is uh, important because we have seen something of a very weird uh, reshuffling of cards in the composition of the new government. Some pro-Russian uh, pro voices, like the Minister of Interior, Vulin, are out, 
but also Zorana Mihailovic, the Minister of Energy, who had a reputation of being pro-Western. Some even say that she was more uh, pro-American than pro-EU, but there's, that's all uh, an issue of perspective. She's also out of the picture. But uh, I think that uh, when it comes to her, I think it appears that multiple factors probably played a role. Probably Vucic trying to satisfy the conservative parts of his electorate, where Mihailovic was never too popular, so he had to say, OK, I removed some figures who are pro-Russian, but I'm also now removing her. So the problems with the electrical distribution in Serbia is also something for which uh, Zorana Mihailovic, as a former energy minister, can also be scapegoated potentially when it comes to the communication strategy of the incumbent government. But I also think that from the standpoint of Aleksandar Vucic, Zorana Mihailovic was not uh, the decisive one for energy diversification. Because I can tell you, this moment in time, the most important, at, at least based from the signals that I'm seeing, the most important issue on, US, on the agenda of Serbo-American ties at this moment in time, it appears to be energy diversification. And so I believe that the rationale of Aleksandar Vucic is, if I'm already cooperating with Americans on this issue, well, I don't need uh, to have uh, Zorana Mihailovic right by my side, which was probably another factor which contributed to her being dismissed. So basically, we don't know what we would do if they would switch off. I, belie I believe that it is precisely because he doesn't know what he would do is he tries to avoid it. Did you want to add to this what well, we would I do in short term? We would lose 90% of the gas supply, that's yes. for sure. So that's but what, what we wouldn't lose? Uh, well, uh, we wouldn't lose what is in the storage, okay? So okay. <laughs> some of it is there. Some of it can be perhaps replaced with oil in some uses. Some uses it's irreplaceable. And I think the biggest issue is actually the heating of Belgrade, Novi Sad and Niš. So the three cities with these three heating systems are relying on gas for heating. So this is the, I think, most vulnerable point from the political perspective uh, in the whole equation. Thank you. Uh, I think this would be the last question and we're also r already running late. And unless there is uh, one more question that is really important, we will be closing the panel after this. Thank one. you very much. My name is Olivia Lazard. I'm a fellow at Carnegie Europe. I have two questions for you, Alexander. One is you mentioned carbon capture systems. Can you tell me more about where the... I, we don't hear you. Two ah. questions. Can you... So I mean, we, we hear, hear you, you, but we, we don't, don't hear understand. you very clear. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay. Is that better now? Uh, it yeah. is, yeah. Yes, okay. My name is Olivia Lazard. I work for Carnegie Europe as a fellow. I have two questions for you, Alexander. One is, you mentioned cap carbon capture systems. Yes. Can you tell me more about what you, where the conversations are at here? Second question, where are conversations at regarding nuclear energy in the region? And the very last question is actually for Vuk. Rebounding on your um, Russia-China cooperation in Africa, I see a lot of that happening in the various zones where I work. My question for you is where do you see the investments on the Russian side coming in regarding extraction? Because from a technological and financial perspective, I don't see a lot of know-how going into Africa coming from Russia. Very briefly, the, the carbon capture dialogue is nowhere, so that doesn't exist. Uh, I've mentioned it as a theoretical possibility for this uh, particular right. technology, and I also think, based on a lim limited knowledge, that there are not so many real physical opportunities also here in our country. But definitely more research uh, would be uh, would be good on nuclear technology. Obviously, the topic is alive. It wasn't alive for many, many years. Now it's alive, and I mean, that's the only thing I can, I can tell. Uh, we obviously don't have the logistics and the infrastructure we would need to have if we are going to go this direction, but the nuclear discussion was also part of the, the discussion during the preparation of the National Energy and Climate Plan of the Republic of Serbia. So it entered the public policy sphere, so, so it's there. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, I mean, I will. Oh, yes. I mean, regarding Africa, I mean, I can tell you the extractables have been one, extractive industry have been one uh, area where the Russians have been valuable partner for the local governments because if there is one uh, experience that the Russians do have, that is the extractables. Now, of course, I mean, we have seen in, an, uh, in Angola the diamond mines and uh, as uh, Russia is under sanctions, I can tell you that they are very interested of getting their hands on uh, local resources like uh, gold and uh, diamonds in the places like uh, Republic of Sudan and Central African Republic. 
these resources are important not only for the revenues of state budget. I mean, Russia already has many of these resources. But if you tap into those resources in a foreign jurisdictions, they are very good assets to circumvent sanctions and they are not as easily seized as uh, the bank accounts, for example. But I mean, when it comes to materials like uh, renewables or, for example, uranium, I can tell you one place is uh, Sahel. I think that Mali and uh, Burkina Faso are too. And uh, I can tell you that the French are also very panicking about the potential of Niger being endangered by the Russian influence, particularly because France is largely dependent on nuclear energy, so they might uh, be afraid if there is any political chaos in Niger that uh, the Russians can tap into uranium exploitation on which their own uh, energy supply is independent. But when it comes to the, but, uh, the two industries which will be under very heavy pressure from the Russians because of the lack of Western technology, mining and the military industry. And if I were to draw, draw two scenarios, how will the Russians try to circumvent these difficulties? One is global black market, where you will have basically biggest smuggling operation sanctioned by the state anywhere. And number two is relying on the Chinese. And I believe that the Chinese are now careful, but at one point or another, they will jump in and uh, provide uh, technology to the Russians. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? No, so thank you very much. I would just like to briefly wrap up because we don't have a lot of time. We have to uh, vacate the room. So I would like to say that um, what, what, what we can, what's take away? Well, there are options. This crisis can be uh, also an opportunity. Well, with all challenges that we just discussed, uh, geopolitical consequences will always be present, but we have to choose our game. There are some opportunities with regional neighborhood, with uh, uh, diversifying uh, supply. But I would, uh, for the last uh, and take away, leave this big, uh, let's say, uh, neglected potential that we have here in Serbia and in the Western Balkans. Uh, we haven't reached satisfactory levels of renewable energy deployment from local sources. And we also have uh, unfinished projects when it comes to reversible hydropower uh, that could also uh, contribute to balancing. And uh, we also have a big uh, un uh, uh, untapped potential with the households, with citizens that, as we heard from Alexander, have money and also have a problem with outdated, inefficient stoves. So renewable energy, energy efficiency, all the way to the households, and then uh, diversify beyond uh, uh, Serbia and the region of Western Balkans. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.